Uh, and then, okay, I see that uh, Naima started to record. Uh, and then if you have any technical issue, we have uh, Naima with us. Uh, Naima, I don't know if you want to say hi. hi uh, and actually, Naima is going to explain you quickly uh, something important about the visualization mode, because uh, now you can see, I mean, depending on, on what you chose, you have different options between gallery and so on. Uh, and Naima would like to explain you what's the best option. Thank you, Chantal. So very quickly, if you to better enjoy the webinar, we recommend to click on the top right bottom of your Zoom screen. You have a button that's called View. And I will recommend to put the speaker uh, view. So like that, you will see the person that is actually presenting instead of everyone. So it's a little bit less messy. So enjoy. Thanks, Naima, is it clear for everyone? I mean, the most important is that you see the slides and you hear the voice, so that, that's true, but it's always a, a bit of a comfort also to be able to see the, the person speaking. Uh, so thanks, Naima, for this. We have great experts with us today. Um, you may know them already. Uh, they are Anne-Sophie Pellier from BirdLife International, Jesus Pinilla from uh, CO BirdLife, we have also Vanya Satsu from METSI, uh, and we have Selma Benzikri from Vertigo Lab. So I will introduce more in detail these four wonderful people later, but uh, for now, I would like to welcome Raphael Billet from the Tour du Valais, who kindly accepted to tell a few words uh, to open the webinar. So Raphael, while, while you're joining, I will quickly introduce you. Uh, Raphael joined the Tour du Valais in March 2021 as program director. The Tour du Valais, for those who don't know it, is the research center for wetlands in the Mediterranean, I would say. Um, so Raphael has some 20 years of experience on different uh, uh, topics, but among others, and the most relevant for us today are that he has uh, experience on coastal zone management, on the implementation of innovative financing mechanisms, as well as um, adapting to climate change. An important thing also uh, to know about Raphael is that he recently led the rescue project. That was a large scale project to support the implementation of nature-based solutions for adapting to climate change in the Pacific Islands. So Raphael, welcome. Uh, the floor is yours. I think you have a presentation, so we, we might need uh, Anne-Sophie to stop sharing the screen and Raphael to share yours. Yes, thank you, Chantal. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, here you go. Does it work? Yes. OK. So first of all, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, what I will try to do is uh, really just to, to give a brief introduction and uh, some issues regarding the economics of NDS. So it's not a lecture about the economics of NDS and you have plenty other presentations to reflect on. Uh, it, I just wanted to give a couple of examples and raise a few questions that I think would be relevant for today and also probably for the, for the next few uh, webinars. Uh, as you said, Chantal, uh, Tour du Valais is a research institute for the conservation of Mediterranean wetlands. And just in, in two words, what I want to stress is that we have a, a quite narrow focus, which is uh, the wetlands in the Mediterranean, but we do, uh, we like to think that we do everything about them. So we do scientific research, uh, we do management also, we have uh, 3000 hectares of estate uh, in the Camargue. Uh, we do a lot of, uh, about conveying uh, the results of what we do um, and then transferring that knowledge and also some advocacy uh, meaning that we are trying to convince decision makers of the importance to uh, protect uh, Mediterranean wetlands. We have five themes of activities, species conservation, eco-health or one health if you prefer, ecosystem management and restoration, wetlands, uh, wetland dynamics and water management. And we have also a number of uh, science society interfaces mechanisms. We work at three uh, scales, the Mediterranean basin, the Camargue Delta, 
and the estate, as I said, which is about 3,000 hectares. So that was for Tour du Galland. Of course, we are happy to answer any question. I'm saying we because I have some colleagues with me on this webinar today. Um, just to warm up, you, you're probably all familiar with uh, nature-based solutions now. Uh, it's been uh, quite a, a big topic internationally in the last few years, especially since uh, the, not the last one, but the previous IUCN Congress in Hawaii in 2016. Uh, so just to warm up and, and make sure we, we start from the same page, uh, nature-based solutions are actions to protect sustainably managed and restore natural and modified ecosystems in ways that address societal challenges effectively and adaptively to provide both human well-being and biodiversity benefits. Uh, it's important also to keep in mind that uh, we're talking about nature-based solutions, and these are solutions to specific issues, of course. Uh, it's sometimes uh, a weakness, I would say, of the, <clears throat> of the concept or of the name of the concept is that uh, we have the word solutions, but we don't necessarily know uh, solutions to what. So IUCN has uh, classified those uh, in uh, very useful clusters. So uh, I won't read them, but you're, you're already probably familiar. And what's important is that for an intervention to be considered an NBS, it must address one or multiple societal challenges in an integrated manner. And if uh, the main challenge, if, or if one of the challenges that is addressed by an, MBA, uh, by an NBS is biodiversity loss, then it has to address other issues as well, other challenges to be considered an NBS. So that we just, um, we, so that we're not confused between good old conservation activities and actual NBS. <clears throat> now, um, why worry about the economics of NBS? I've put here a number of uh, key references internationally, most of them are, uh, are already very well known. Uh, what's common uh, to most of this, uh, of this literature is uh, that there is a widespread promise about NDS that they be cost effective, easy to maintain, and long-term solutions with multiple benefits. Uh, and quite often, I haven't made an extensive and systematic literature review, but my feeling uh, reading uh, such documentation is that very often you have a lot of declarations and assumptions about the fact that NDS are cost effective and so on and so forth, uh, rather than actual economic valuations and cost benefit analysis. So you have a lot of you know, general discussion about, yes, we are, we are confident that uh, nature-based solutions are cost-effective, but you, you don't have that many figures, I find. And of course, the question is, uh, well, if uh, nature-based solutions are cost-effective, easy to maintain, long-term solutions, efficient, we're bringing multiple benefits, then why are, are they not already the first choice of any decision maker? why I was struggling to actually mainstream uh, this NDS and why are gray uh, solutions very often the first choice of decision makers. Uh, it's, uh, <clears throat> it's a multi-faceted uh, question, but I think that at least one question that we should ask is whether it's an economics issue, whether uh, there is an economic point to be made uh, so that we convince decision makers that NDS are uh, a very uh, a very relevant choice in most contexts. And to do that, uh, we have to wonder if economics, including cost-benefit analysis, uh, can help and can actually make a difference concretely. Uh, we're all, of course, confident that uh, any economist can come up with a CDA about pretty much anything, but the, the key issue really is whether this uh, economic valuations, this cost benefit analysis will be used by decision makers and will make a difference. Just want to start from uh, an example uh, on which we're working at Tour du Vala. And uh, really, everything I know about this has been taught to me by my colleagues, and especially Lisa and Lorena, who are attending the webinar. So, if there are any questions about the technicalities, they'll be on board to, to respond. 
Uh, <clears throat> but just in a few words, it's a, I think it's an interesting example for a discussion today. Uh, it's an NDS project on the hydrological and ecological restoration of the area that's in green on your screen. Um, and as, as you know, uh, I'm not going into the details about Camargue, but what you have to keep in mind is, is that it's a very artificialized and polarized delta uh, with very little natural uh, water uh, fluxes left. Uh, this part that was in green on the previous slide and that is in yellow here of about 6,500 uh, hectares uh, was sold uh, by uh, the private company who owned it. Who, who owned it. Uh, it was sold to the Coastal Conservancy, the French Coastal Conservancy, in several phases started, starting from uh, 2008. Uh, and it was not uh, the Coastal Conservancy who, uh, who actively uh, tried to purchase it. It was really the company who wanted to get rid of this. Then when it was sold, uh, the diagnosis by uh, the, cons uh, the Coastal Conservancy and many stakeholders around uh, was that uh, you know, keeping the seashore where it was, was uh, basically impossible. So of course, impossible means impossible, uh, not at any cost, but at reasonable costs. Uh, and also that there was an increased uh, risk of submersion of this area because of uh, sea level rise, essentially. And so that it would cost more and more in the future to protect this area against the sea. And that uh, for that reason, no human settlement should be uh, allowed to take place there. So the strategy uh, was to implement adaptive management to sea, uh, to sea level, level rise, so adaptation to sea level rise by a planned and progressive retreat, which means that uh, the, the seafront dikes uh, which are in green on, on the map, uh, were abandoned, basically. Um, and uh, the focus was on consolidating and maintaining the inshore dike, which is in red uh, on your screen. Um, so the restoration has been active. Some work uh, needed to be done. Uh, restoration of hydraulic and biological connections, especially between the Baccarat uh, hydro system and the sea via uh, the former salt works or salt pans and the restoration of connections with the Rhone River uh, via the Japan uh, watershed. I'm not going into the details, but uh, in a nutshell, the biodiversity response is very good, meaning that uh, a lot of species enjoy this new and restored environment. So we see more birds, more fish, and so on and so forth. Uh, the socioeconomic response is uh, overall good as well. Some activities uh, are developing in terms of uh, ecotourism, for example. Uh, but what's important for the discussion today is that uh, this project is uh, subject to heated debates. Uh, it's not always well understood or accepted by uh, some local stakeholders. It's, uh, there, there are very uh, mixed feelings about it. So in that context, uh, what is the role of uh, economics or what was the role of economics in such an NDS project? As I said, uh, the decision process was quite uh, simple and that's why it's, uh, it's useful for a, a 15 minute discussion. Uh, it's just a private company who decides to sell salt pans because profits do not compensate uh, maintenance costs of the seafront dike. So basically business is becoming impossible. And the Coastal Conservancy is buying the area, mainly for biodiversity or nature conservation purposes, um, with a strong push by the Ministry of Environment in France, because uh, from a pure uh, economic rationality for the Coastal Conservancy, uh, it was debatable whether it made sense to buy such a large area that risk uh, disappearing in the next few decades. So when the Coastal Conservancy bought the area, there was, uh, to simplify, uh, a decision to be made between two options. The first option was to restore and maintain the seafront dike, okay, and the, the calculations that, was made, that were made at that time showed that 
uh, it would take a, an upfront investment of 20 to 41 million euros, uh, maintenance costs of 800,000 euros per year, uh, forever, basically, and probably even increasing, of course, as sea level rise and climate change uh, uh, go worse. And with poor biodiversity outcomes, because as long as, as you have this seafront dike, it means that there's no real connection between the delta and the sea. And so biodiversity is very hard to restore. The other option was to retreat, reconnect, and maintain the inshore dike, the one that was in red on the previous map. This uh, requested an, an upfront investment of 1.5 million euros only for the salt pans to restore the salt pans themselves. So compared to the 20 to 41 million in the first option, and the 7 to 30 million euros uh, investment for the inshore dike, the red one, which is also actually necessary with the seafront dike because it's not enough to really protect the whole area in case of uh, very strong storms. Uh, the maintenance cost uh, was also evaluated to be much less, 80 to 140,000 euros per year. And biodiversity gains were anticipated to be quite high. So it was admittedly very rough figures. There was no ecosystem services valuation for any of the, of the two options. And there was no uh, cost benefit analysis as such. There was, you know, the decision was made really just on very rough figures of what it could cost in, in both options. And so the, I would say that the decision for the Coastal Conservancy to go for uh, uh, an adaptive management approach and uh, what we call a nature-based solution was quite obvious. It's a bit like the, in the case of the Catskills in uh, close to New York. I don't know, you probably heard about that case in the US. Uh, where, where uh, uh, the local uh, government had to choose between working on the watershed with farmers to get clean water or building a water treatment plant, a plant. And the, you know, the calculation was so obvious that it was actually never made or never made at the time of the decision. So the decision was obvious, but it led to heated debates, as I said, and these debates are not over. So I would say that actually the decision process itself is not completely over. Uh, I, I'm not sure, uh, I cannot uh, be sure that in 10 years from now, uh, the way we manage the area with the Coastal Conservancy will still be the same. So based on this example, and just to, to start concluding my presentation, I want to raise a few questions to consider uh, when addressing uh, issues surrounding the economics of NDS. The first one is about how can uh, cost-benefit analysis of NDS be done? So the how, the, the methodology, the methods, and how, of course, how can they be done? But most importantly, how can they be uh, robust enough? We have to come up with good, robust figures if they are to be used. And what are the key, some key obstacles? And you, I'm sure you will discuss that uh, in much more details uh, on, during the three webinars, but there are many obstacles to, to CBAs. Uh, there is uncertainty with regard to long-term benefits uh, with NDS because you, you work with nature, you work with ecological processes. So there is, or you, you can assume that uh, there are more uncertainties than in the case of uh, a gray uh, solution. At least it's not the same uncertainties, I should say. Uh, in some cases, you also have uh, small numbers of beneficiaries or low value of ecosystem services to be valued, uh, which also uh, raises issues for your CBAs. Uh, another issue is that uh, the efficiency of gray or nature-based solutions is often difficult to compare. Uh, because they, uh, you, you, you don't design solutions to exactly the same problems and they don't provide exactly the same services. So in most cases, you know, it's, just, it's, it's not just about replacing a gray solution by a nature-based solution. It, it's actually a different set of solutions and a different future altogether that you're planning. So difficult to compare. Uh, there are very uh, significant distributional issues uh, that have to be considered. Who wins 
in the case of gray uh, solutions implementation who loses and the same for nature based it's usually not, not the same stakeholders and has to be taken into account uh, so do, do you have a lot to go how how much time do i have uh, you're already over time, but it's okay. so interesting so, that I think it's good that you're setting the scene. So, uh, but I if you, go, yeah, in I, one, I two minutes. In two minutes. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. Yeah, Thanks. Sure. I'm sorry for that. No worries. Uh, so you have it here. Uh, first set of questions about how to do uh, the cost-benefit analysis. Uh, second set of questions about uh, will they be used? As I said, uh, you know, these tools, these economic tools are useful only if they are used. It's uh, quite obvious, but it's important to keep in mind. And I've just put this uh, reference to uh, a paper published in 2013 that we, sh we should always remember that, that there is a lot of evidence of economic valuations being produced and not being used. It doesn't mean that they are bound not to be used. It means that we have to be careful and that we have to design them with the use in mind. So in a demand-driven uh, perspective rather than a supply-demand, uh, supply-driven perspective, sorry. Uh, so they need to be fit for purpose, to be suited to decision processes. Timing is important. And, you know, in the case of Camar that I briefly explained, the fact that there was no and probably no need for a CBA originally doesn't mean that we, we wouldn't need to do it today. Because as I said, the decision process seems to be over. But is it really over? Do we need to uh, spend more energy convincing people even once the decision seems to, to have been made already? And the third uh, set of questions that I suggest is uh, if they are used, are they going to be useful? Meaning, are they going to serve the purpose that we want them to serve? Uh, can they make a difference under which conditions? And could they be counterproductive? When you do a cost-benefit analysis, you always have to consider the eventuality that uh, the cost may exceed the benefits. And then what do you do with that? So thank you very much. Uh, don't forget that for Christmas you can uh, adopt uh, Flamingo and uh, <laughs> I Vala and our activities through that. Thank you. It's a very nice thing actually. I did it last year for my nephews and they still follow because you receive newsletters and it's really nice to see that you have your Flamingo and you follow. So it's a nice way to get uh, uh, people uh, also in connection with the world of, uh, of wetlands, I would say. Thanks a lot, Rafael, for, uh, for opening. Uh, we're going to jump into our first session, but while uh, Selma and Anne Sophia are joining, I just would like to insist on, uh, on the fact that today's webinar is uh, an introduction. So uh, it's actually, as Rafael was saying, part of a series that you will also be welcome to attend until next spring. Uh, and the next sessions will go much more into details. Another important thing that uh, these webinars are not about um, uh, is that we're not going to give you magic uh, formula on how to implement uh, NBS in terms of uh, uh, practices. I think uh, the case of uh, Camargue is a specific example and in all your areas, you would find different situations, especially uh, having to talk with local stakeholders. Uh, but what is important is that you get into the mindset. Uh, there is clearly a shift. I think uh, if this concept has been uh, taking off in 2016, there is a reason. Uh, people are changing, organizations are changing, companies are changing, the world is changing. And there is a bigger connection now uh, more than ever between the economy and nature. Uh, so it's really about getting into the concept and, and understanding how things are going to work. And last but not the least, this is not about restoration practices. So if this is what you're expecting, we just wouldn't like to uh, disappoint you on this. This, this is not going to, to be about this. So uh, hoping the, the points are clear for all, let's look quickly uh, at the agenda. Uh, but I think you've had time while I was speaking uh, to see that we are first going to enter uh, in a, a bit of context. So understand what's the situation in the Mediterranean and how in this context we can highlight the benefits of NBS. And then we'll have a second part that goes into an overview of the methodology on both cost-benefit analysis and stakeholder engagement. 
And then uh, we will listen to more cases from the ground, uh, specifically in Sardinia and Spain. And our last part will be dedicated to uh, discuss together and, and conclude. Um, so as I said, you will be given the opportunity to ask questions at the end of the presentation. So we have that space dedicated, but feel free also while uh, speakers are uh, presenting to start writing your questions in the chat if you feel more comfortable with the chat. So let's start our first session. Uh, as I said, it's going to give you an overview on the Mediterranean context and help you understand the concepts of NBS, ecosystem services, and how they are both different, but uh, very much interconnected at the same time. For this session, uh, our presenters are Anne-Sophie Pellier and Selma Benzekri. Anne-Sophie is a conservation scientist with 10 years of experience in the science policy interface. She's been managing projects across Southeast Asia, Latin America, and Europe. Since 2018, she leads the work on ecosystem services for bird life and the development of a, a, a toolkit that some of you might have heard about, which is called TESSA, uh, and is valuing ecosystem services. Uh, for non-specialist especially. And Sophie strongly believes that uh, sharing knowledge, tools, and methodologies is the best way to ensure that we restore, protect, and manage ecosystems, such as wetland, while generating socioeconomic opportunities. Selma, on the other hand, is a consultant in environmental economy. She has a background in agronomy engineering and environmental management. She holds a master's degree in public policies and environmental strategy. So that's an interesting combination for the, the topic we're going to talk about. Uh, Selma has also worked for the French Environment Ministry on environmental valuation of planning projects for the company um, that some of you know called Veolia. And she was working on their environmental plan, and now she has joined Vertigo Lab to work on environmental public policies tools, environmental prospective, biodiversity conservation, ecosystem services, NBS, and topics connected to environmental economy. So ladies, the floor is yours. And thank you very much, Chantal. Um, and thank you very much, Raphael, as well. All very good points on the cost-benefit analysis. And uh, we try to uh, get to that into the discussion at the end of the webinar. Um, so first of all, I wanted to uh, also expose you a little bit the Mediterranean context. And um, so you may uh, all well be aware, sorry, I do have a bit of a problem. Okay. Um, so you may all know that um, the wetlands in the Mediterranean basin cover uh, 1.7 to 2.4% of the total surface of these 27 Mediterranean countries. And it's about 18.5 um, million hectares. So globally, it represents about 2% um, of the wetlands. Um, and this is really something very important because in the Mediterranean region, um, they enable this region to be a global biodiversity hotspot, and they are amongst the most productive ecosystems. So they can be lagoons, dunes, deltas, um, tidal marshes, uh, etc. Um, and uh, the problem nowadays that we have in the in the Mediterranean basin is that the maintenance of these key habitats for biodiversity, but also the multiple benefits uh, they provide to people, such as flood uh, alleviation. Um, is still threatened by uh, multiple pressures. And today, they are the world's most threatened ecosystems. And these wetlands uh, were seen you know, as lands that need to be drained, uh, converted, and especially to uh, be highly productive. And um, in the 20th century, this process really accelerated with the fast growing population. And uh, these really drove a runaway of coastal development uh, and also an increase in natural resources use. So we lost 48% uh, of those wetlands in the last 50 years and 23% of them, of the remaining ones, uh, were replaced um, in uh, artificial uh, wetlands. So it's due to uh, several pressures. Uh, so we do have drainage, water abstractions, um, that is um, quite uh, significant, uh, coming from a uh, conversion uh, in agricultural, urban, and also industrial lands, uh, but also the intensification and expansion of those lands. Um, and we do have also other pressures such as pollution, overexploitation of resources, such as overfishing that you can see on, the, on this uh, uh, figure, and disturbance. 
And this is, uh, you know, um, already a constant uh, because we uh, have um, the, the, the med population, at least one third of it, lives in those uh, coastal zones. So the, 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 the pressures are going to uh, just intensify more and more. Um, that said, um, this is of a high concern. And on the top of that, we do have um, climate change that comes to exacerbate uh, the negative impacts on those wetlands. And the IPCC um, have done a report um, um, in 2019, um, and they forecast that 20 to 90% uh, of existing coastal wetlands um, will be lost by uh, 2100. So depending on different scenarios of climate change, such as um, sea level rise, so um, this forecasting um, results make sense. Um, since today, uh, wetlands are already disappearing three times faster than natural forests. Um, and on the uh, right, uh, left uh, hand side, uh, you can see the, the map here. So one of our, of our project partner, uh, METSI, uh, is, is working on coastal risks map. And they are forecasting the impacts uh, due to climate change for coastal wetlands in the Mediterranean regions uh, for 2,100. So in the map, um, they did, for example, the coastal wetlands um, risk for Gahel Mela in Tunisia. Uh, and you can see that the blue zone uh, indicates that the area would be under floods in uh, 2,100 due to a uh, sea uh, level rise. And you can see that uh, the lagoon uh, of uh, Gahel Mela, which is uh, here, will completely disappear. The red line uh, is the extent of the impact uh, in the area uh, that takes into account multiple um, climate uh, drivers, such as sea level rise, um, a storm surge, and, and precipitation. And you can see that the, the extent is quite uh, significant um, by uh, 2100. So, of course, all of this has uh, tremendous consequences, um, such as erosion, um, flooding. Um, we have water abstraction that can lead to uh, infiltration of salt in groundwater that uh, also leads to higher scarcity of drinking water um, and issues to irrigate crops, for instance. And we do have a loss of biodiversity that is um, really um, important nowadays. We have 36% of wetland uh, dependent species are threatened by extension in the in Mediterranean. And, uh, there has been some regional and global assessments uh, that predict that sea level rise alone um, in, in Europe will lead to um, 20 to 50% of the loss of uh, the ecosystem of marshland, for instance, by the end of, of the century. So globally in the Mediterranean, we can really say that it's um, an ecological, economic, but also a social uh, crisis. We wanted to show you this uh, via some examples. Um, so the uh, first one is the lagoon of Sena Arubia in Sardinia that was hit by um, a big flooding event. Um, and this was due um, to uh, heavy rain precipitation um, that were coming from uh, inland. Um, and although there is no official reports uh, yet from uh, local authorities, um, the partners on the ground have gathered some information on production loss. Um, and the costs uh, were estimated to be over uh, 1 million uh, euros. Um, so the lagoon water storage capacity probably reached its uh, maximum and wasn't able um, to um, adapt to this, uh, to this event. The second example is in France, um, also um, events of flooding and the estimated costs of it uh, was estimated to be uh, of 390 million euros. Um, and these flooding events that um, happened in July uh, 2021 was actually um, happening across Western and Central Europe. And uh, the, the cost uh, of these damages over uh, this uh, European uh, region was over 10 billion euros. So when we imagine that the frequency of such natural disasters will um, has doubled over the last 30 years, uh, we can imagine that all of, of these damages could be avoided if we are able to actually protect, uh, manage efficiently, or restore um, this kind of key uh, ecosystems. Um, we do have also a tour du Vala uh, that has done um, a study in five Mediterranean uh, watersheds in Algeria, France, Greece, and Spain. And um, the um, study estimated that the population capacity of such uh, watersheds 
um, had decreased by 20% between uh, 1987 and 2016, so in the last uh, 30 years. So it is uh, really um, an important um, uh, thing to really protect this ecosystem and find solutions that will uh, really um, help towards this uh, the, their resilience. So the governments, um, to reduce this climate and disaster risk. They usually embark on building traditional engineering infrastructure such as uh, levees, dams, or even uh, dikes. And dikes uh, were often first built to reclaim land from the sea. And I think uh, participants here today um, may know that uh, you know that that's maybe the case in their in their region, and it's the case in many countries of the of the Mediterranean. But the issue with this infrastructure, they can interrupt um, wetland connectivity. They can disrupt aquatic habitats. Um, they can reduce the functions of the wetlands in, for instance, removing pollutants or absorbing flood waters, um, and they may actually increase losses uh, when there are, uh, you know, high events uh, such as flooding. And without the hard infrastructures in place, sea level rise normally would lead to um, the wetlands moving inland. But in many places, um, these hard structures are actually preventing uh, this natural adaptation of the ecosystem, which means that there are not only less suitable uh, habitats for migratory birds, but we um, are also losing uh, benefits of nature in those uh, ecosystems. So with one example of the, of the Tunis Gulf, um, scientists at the University of Carthage and the Research Institute for Development estimated that the retreat of the coastline um, in the Gulf um, was at the rate of over 20 meters per year. Um, so sandy beaches may actually completely disappear in the near, in the near future. And that's a, a phenomenon that was due to uh, dams that were built uh, more inland to um, enable um, water uh, resources and needs for people. Um, but these dams trap sand and sediments and um, which you know, are not supplied enough uh, to uh, the coasts, uh, neither to the beaches. And this ecosystem um, cannot maintain themselves in this case. And um, the Medjerda, which is the largest river in Tunisia, has not transported any sand to the coast of the Gulf um, for uh, 20 years. And uh, this has tremendous impacts because it led to um, erosion, but also accompanied by uh, coastal flooding. And this is occurring along almost uh, all the Mediterranean coasts now. Um, this has significant impact on the population, um, which, as we've seen, for the majority lives in coastal zones. And this retreat not only has you know, infrastructure damages, but um, the sea that is being closer to the land means that uh, there is a salinization of soil and, and water. And this is almost uh, unavoidable now. But um, has Raphael um, kindly um, presented uh, at the beginning of the webinar, and uh, now there are uh, one solution that has really you now uh, strongly emerged, which is to work with enhanced nature to address uh, all these societal challenges and to safeguard human well being um, and biodiversity. So they are known as, as nature-based solution. Um, I am not going to, uh, again, um, provide you the definition. You can, you can read it and Raphael provided it to you um, at the beginning of this webinar. Just know that this concept of nature-based solution, um, you know, some other concepts were already in place before, such as uh, ecosystem-based approaches, ecosystem-based disaster risk reduction. Um, and, uh, you know, society, makes the industry, education and urban and recreation sectors. And, and those sectors really govern uh, natural resources. So natural solution um, could enable the how to change the unsustainable management that we have in uh, natural areas now, and how to create productive but yet healthy ecosystems. So um, in the Mediterranean, the coastal wetlands could be made as a sustainable balance between economic growth um, ecological preservation, but um, also ecosystem uh, resilience. And I think uh, nature-based solutions are really seen as a transformative transition now to a sustainable economy. And um, this should now you know, be increasingly recognized by policy, policy uh, makers and not just uh, as a discussion, but really as action on the ground, as uh, Raphael pointed out. Um, and fortunately, a uh, nature-based solution has now entered the political agenda. And I think that's really at stake now 
We all know that the um, IASHI uh, biodiversity targets um, were not completely um, achieved by uh, 2020. And really now, um, the, it really urged the, the parties and all the governments um, to implement the post-2020 uh, global biodiversity framework. But that could be consistent and in our harmony with uh, the Convention of the CBD and other uh, relevant international obligations that you can see uh, here um, on the slide. Um, they, uh, the Natural Based Solution also supports the Climate Pact um, at the COP26. And for the first time, uh, nature and natural based solution were key components of uh, these negotiations. Um, so, you know, uh, all we do must be nature based and people centered. That has been said. A um, natural based solution can achieve more than a third of the greenhouse gas reductions uh, needed by uh, 2030 to meet the, the Paris climate target. And um, what is quite interesting as well is that the European Commission. Um, is um, establishing a proposal, uh, which is a new European restoration law that is part of the biodiversity strategy for uh, 2030 and is part of the European Green Deal. Um, and this is to establish legally binding targets uh, that would be uh, measurable and can be really monitored. So the objective is to re ensure. Um, that degraded ecosystems such as coastal wetlands that you have in the Mediterranean uh, will be restored and maintained by 2050, but with measurable results already by 2030. So, of course, all of that is really to um, ensure that we halt biodiversity loss and contribute to climate change, um, climate mitigation and, and uh, adaptation. I feel awful to interrupt you and Sophie because all you say is so interesting and valuable, uh, but we're already over time. So um, do you think you can conclude quickly? Yes, yes, I can. Um, and to, to refer a bit that, uh, you know, that, that Raphael uh, told you, uh, policies currently lack information on evidence-based approach. And uh, one of the approaches that we're going to present to you today is actually you know, to ask the question to which extent are natural based solutions cost effective. And to do that, uh, we need to have an integrated, an integrated approach in understanding um, and understanding the, this gap. And it means recognizing the value of wetlands and their services. Uh, so it's done via ecosystem service assessment, but with also an understanding on how they make the value of solutions based on nature and the role of this natural based solution. And this can really inform uh, policy uh, making. Thanks a lot, Anne Sophie. So let's move now to the second presentation on how to highlight the benefits of NBS by Selma. Um, actually, oh, you start, the... actually, you yeah. start, you told me. <laughs> That's true. Apologies. <laughs> no problem. Um, so now we're gonna, uh, you know, we, you've just seen just before that like, it's it's crucial to study the role of uh, nature-based solution and the value, the potential benefits that actually bring to people. Um, so ecosystem services is one of the routes to doing this, um, but we can see um, in the, the next slide, what are ecosystem services and how do they really inform us on? So they, so ecosystem services are all the benefits provided by nature to people at local, regional, and global scales. Um, and they bring human survival and economic health and social well-being. They are produced as a result of ecosystem processes and functions such as nutrient cycling. And they flow to people in the form of benefits that support human well-being. So basically they are, um, let's say the link um, um, between ecological functions with the socioeconomic activities um, and people, human well being, that really depend on those activities. So it can be a provision of food, regulation of climate, and less tangible services such as cultural ones. Uh, they can be classified in different categories. So the first one, for instance, provisioning services related to water provision or cultivation, um, harvesting what goods, such as food, um, including medicinal resources as well. We do have regulation and maintenance uh, services. So coastal wetlands, for instance, uh, provide crucial benefits to many coastal communities by protecting them from flooding or storm surges. And the benefits from these ecosystem services can include prevention of uh, loss of life, um, damages to housing, food sources, and also prevent uh, saltwater intrusion, as we um, discussed just before. And we have also the cultural uh, services, uh, which relates to the connection that people have with nature. 
So this contact contributes to the spiritual experience, provide re recreational enjoyment, for instance, um, but they are especially known to have um, a tremendous positive impact uh, and long-term ones on the health and happiness of, of people. So some local communities have deep cultural connection to the area they live. Um, and one example, for instance, um, in the uh, in Tunisia, um, with uh, one of our, of our partner, uh, AO, who are working with uh, local communities in Gahalmea, um, artisanal farmers are really culturally attached to um, nature because um, you know, um, it really provides them with essential elements to traditionally gr really grow uh, their vegetables in, in polders. Um, a slide to uh, provide you with the global values of this, those ecosystem services. So some studies have been done to try to evaluate um, what would be their economic uh, value. And uh, Costanza et al. in 2014 provided this estimates of um, the global values of 125 trillion of US uh, dollar per year globally. Um, and it is over 1.5 uh, times the size of the global uh, gross domestic product. So it means that if we only focus on the GDP, we are actually underestimating um, the value that ecosystem services bring to, to people and biodiversity. So we really need to uh, take a, a holistic approach when we assess those um, services. Um, and uh, Costa Zay also provided um, global values of, of the benefits of nature um, uh, with an estimate between 1997 and 2011. And the inland coastal wetlands were estimated to um, have uh, ecosystem services reaching 50 trillion US dollars per year uh, worldwide. And it is a conservative estimate. So it means that uh, the estimates may even be much higher. So it approximately represents 53% of the current global um, uh, GDP. Um, and Globally, uh, we are also losing ecosystem services from uh, land use conversion. And um, owing to, to this uh, conversion, um, there is a, a, a reducing of a reduction of this global value at a rate of uh, 4.3 to 20.2 trillion uh, US dollar uh, per year. So it's particularly important to address since our economies and societies really depend on, on those natural resources, uh, but also for the poor and, and vulnerable uh, communities, which are most of the time critically dependent on the provision of those uh, services. Um, wanted to uh, provide you the uh, figure that is on in the article of uh, Sedan et al. from 2019. Um, um, this figure is provided to, to uh, show how to integrate nature-based solution to climate change impacts into the social ecological vulnerability framework that has been formalized by the IPCC. Um, but here, I just uh, wanted to show you this figure in the purpose only to, to show that the um, ecosystems um, have um, adaptive um, capacity um, and, um, and and this uh, adaptive capacity um, is under um, you know, potential impacts such as um, floods um, and that can really alter the function and processes of this kind of ecosystem and actually the flow of ecosystem services that uh, they provide um, and also the socio-economic benefits upon which society depend on so the nature-based solutions are really at the interface between the ecosystem and the socio-ecosystem, socio socio-economic system, sorry. Um, and if they are implemented in a way that can increase the resilience of coastal ecosystem and the ecosystem services um, flow, they can actually empower society and communities in, in protecting, restoring, and managing ecosystems along with um, um, sustainable socio-economic uh, development that would help the overall social ecological uh, system. So nature-based solution would reduce the vulnerability of the social ecological system uh, as a whole. And uh, this is really important to take into account for um, coastal wetlands in the Mediterranean and basin, for instance. So my colleague um, uh, Selma will present you now the, the concept of uh, nature-based solution. We cannot hear you, Selma. Okay. Yeah. 
Okay. That should be right. Yeah. So we can basically use the, this link between uh, ecosystem services and NBS uh, in order to have a glance on the diversity of NBS that exists. And as you can see on this graph, uh, this classification um, depends on the link between the ES and the level of engineering that uh, is applied to ecosystems. Uh, and this that is, that is necessary for those actions. Um, so this typology by uh, Egerman and Al uh, is known and shared upon the scientific community and shows the diversity of actions that can fit in the frame of uh, nature-based solutions. So for example, for the, the type one, uh, which is the use of a natural ecosystem, you will require a low level of engineering, but provide a great diversity of ecosystem services without focusing on one or two ecosystem services. Uh, that would be strategies like global uh, planning strategies and sustainable strategies. Uh, the second type would be the managed or restored ecosystem, uh, where you require a medium level of engineering and provide a smaller proportion of ecosystem services, but you focus more on uh, the delivery of those ecosystem services. And that would be all actions of sustainable management that you can find in this category. And the third type of, um, of NBS is the creation of a new ecosystem, which requires a lot of engineering, uh, usually with higher costs, and uh, which is focused uh, on one or two ecosystem services. And that would be all actions of environmental or ecological engineering. So to illustrate this, um, okay, um, more concretely, uh, for the type one, you could have the use of natural ecosystem would be like with uh, limiting the access to a certain uh, natural area renowned for its fragile um, species or habitats. So it's, for example, the case in Camargue in the South of France, uh, where human presence uh, could have a negative impact on the natural or desired ecosystem functions. Um, so the access would be limited or, or forbidden to protect uh, this natural area. For the second type, which is the manage or restored ecosystem, you could have the sustainable use of fertilizer. Uh, by limiting the use of mineral fertilizers, promoting the use of organic fertilizers or biostimulants, and by considering uh, soil properties and biology. So this is, for example, uh, implemented in the city of Strasbourg in France uh, with a policy of zero pesticides. And finally, the third type of NBS, which is illustrated here, is the creation of new ecosystem with with the ecological engineering and the use of plants and their inter interactions uh, with the microorganisms to depollute uh, some soils and area. And it's the case here on this example in New Caledonia uh, with uh, some uh, techniques uh, which are tested to treat uh, nickel residues. So more, I, and uh, yes, uh, if we focus on examples uh, in the Mediterranean context, uh, you can also uh, see that NBS could be a combination of uh, the, thir the three types of NBS to tackle a single challenge, uh, which is here the, the example of the coastline protection challenge. Uh, thanks to uh, the NBS uh, multifunctionality. Uh, and so the interest of those NBS is that they provide several ecosystem services. So for example, on the left, uh, you can see uh, that we can translate the individual actions that we can lead into NBS technical terms. So for the type one, um, uh, you have the sustainable uh, and improved management of the dunes with the protection of those dunes by restricting uh, access to the dunes, providing uh, a high um, diversity of ecosystem services and restoring a, a, a large number of ecosystem services, as you can see on the right. 
For the type two, you will have the rehabilitation of the dunes uh, by maintaining vegetation to stabilize the sand, um, providing a smaller proportion of ecosystem services. And the type three, uh, which is the Posidonia herbarium restoration by replanting species. And it's more uh, focused on engineering techniques and so focusing on uh, ecosystem services such as biodiversity regeneration, carbon sequestration, or may also fishing activities, for example. And so to illustrate a little bit this diversity of uh, solution that could be made uh, to fit in the NBS framework, uh, the IUCN took the subject uh, in hand and created uh, this uh, normalized framework that you all know of. And so the, the, the purpose of this framework is to improve the, the stakeholders' confidence in nature-based solutions but also ensure that actions are effective, upscalable, and also to measure their potential externalities. So they also uh, put in place a self-assessment tool, uh, which is composed of eight criteria. Uh, and there is one criterion, which is the, the fourth criterion, which is focused on economic feasibility, which is of great interest for, for the subject we are treating today. And the, the purpose is uh, to see if project and to check if they fit in the norm and point out uh, the levers that uh, could be actions uh, to improve the pertinence of the, the actions. So you, if you want more information, you can uh, of course uh, consult all the information on the IUCN uh, website. And I, I give the hand to to Anne Sophie again. I would say three minutes to go. I don't know where Anne Sophie is. Sorry, I have, I have been um, muted, I think, uh, along the way. Um, so within this, uh, this figure, I wanted to show you um, how understanding the benefits um, really can inform policy and management uh, responses. So um, if uh, we have um, some policy, um, so, so I'm just gonna try to put it with a laser pointer. If we uh, provide um, you know, um, the ecosystem services assessment and uh, actually what kind of benefits nature-based solution can really bring, um, this can inform policy and management responses um, and in a way, uh, this can really lower down the pressure upon biodiversity, the state of biodiversity and ecosystem resilience um, can be improved. And um, as a, a chain, then uh, increase an improvement of human well-being and increase of benefits of nature uh, would again uh, be improved. Um, so all of that and all this chain uh, really uh, meant that informing on the value of natural-based solution, if implemented um, with uh, sustainable resource use and restoration or even conservation management, uh, can really consequently reduce the, the pressure upon biodiversity and improve um, the state of ecosystems. And of course, this process would need to be done uh, from a local to a global approach. So indigenous people, local communities, NGOs, uh, governments, private companies, and international organizations need to work in a coordinated way with nature now. Um, in implementing nature-based solutions um, that secure sustainable future uh, with healthy um, ecosystems uh, that can provide many crucial uh, services, uh, sustainable development, but also um, you know, along with human well-being and biodiversity protection can be actually supported. And, Thank um, you very much, and Sophie and Selma. I think uh, we've heard so much and so uh, interesting information in the last uh, uh, hour. I think it's really, really uh, uh, interesting. Um, I think you have planned a, a quick survey for the participants. And participants, please do not hesitate to write down the, the questions if you have some. So I just sent uh, some questions for you that should pop on your on your screen right now. So the first one we want to know what type 
what type of coastlands are you working to protect in conservation or policy? And the second question is, have you ever identified the ecosystem services provided by your set of interest? So please go ahead and answer it to these little uh, survey. So I'm going to give everyone a few more seconds so then I can share the results of this poll. Awesome. So uh, now I can share the results with you all. And Sophia and Selma, do you have uh, comments on this? Yeah, so we can see, and it's quite interesting that the lagoon and, and people working um, in ecosystems with delta and estuary uh, water is quite important in, in the region and salinas as well. And uh, you know, so there's there's a a division between uh, natural ecosystems and more artificial ones. And I think that's really great to have all of that. And I can see that the marine um, um, ecosystem with Posidonia is also quite important and they can actually store a lot of, of carbon. And I think that can be also, uh, um, um, you know, at the beginning for a good discussion at the end of the, of the webinar. Um, and if we look at the uh, identification of ecosystem services in your area, uh, we can actually see that uh, most of you already identify them. And I think it would be good to know within the discussion later on if you engage any stakeholders and how uh, you actually identify them. That would be, that would be great, really good. Thank you very much for, for answering all these questions. Okay, Selma, do you want to add something? No, I, it's fine. <laughs> okay, so let's move to the second session. Um, we will continue with you and Sophie and Selma, and you're going to explain us briefly the methodology you use to run cost-benefit analysis and implement stakeholder engagement. Yeah, thank you, Chantal. Um, so as Chantal told you, um, it's really to give you an overview of the concept of cost-benefit analysis of natural-based solution, uh, the details of the ecosystem services assessment and the methodology of cost-benefit analysis will be um, provided in, following, um, in the following webinar. So what is actually a cost-benefit analysis? Um, when we talk um, about it, it is actually the ratio between the benefits for the ecosystem services delivery and the cost of implementation and management um, associated with um, providing or implementing different options, so uh, such as natural-based solution or business as usual. Um, and they really give and inform um, policy decision makers um, in providing them informed um, decisions. So they can go and they can uh, grasp what is the best and most beneficial action to, um, to implement and put in place. Um, so these analyses actually provide a useful, um, even if sometimes it's partial, um, but a good view on the net consequences of decision on human uh, well-being. So the first step would be to do a valuation of ecosystem services, so the benefits, as we, we've seen. Um, you can um, value these ecosystem services in uh, monetary or non-monetary terms. Um, certain um, you know, ecosystem services are more difficult to assess in, in monetary terms and a non-monetary values um, assessment actually are yet to be considered as a priority in the political agenda. Um, and actually they address both environmental and social values of nature. Um, and they are captured uh, by different, uh, differently by different group of, of people. So uh, these um, services uh, that cannot be valued uh, in monetary terms should not be overlooked uh, in the policy uh, decision making. So before going into uh, the diving to your, your valuation of your ecosystem services, you need to um, ask yourself some questions um, if you want your project to really have an impact. So 
first one, um, and this is not an, uh, an, exhaustive, an exhaustive list, there's many other, other questions, but the main ones are here. So what is the objective of your project? What are you trying to, to do or to change? Are you trying to, to preserve? Are you trying to restore a site? Um, what is your, your strategy uh, to do it? Um, the second one is what are the decisions or policies that you really want to influence? Uh, is there any um, relevant or management plan already in place or something that um, will be implemented in the future by local or regional authorities? Um, what is the level of decision making that you are actually targeting? Um, the third one is the, the site context, so ecological, cultural, policy, economic, and political context. And you also need to define the site boundaries in which uh, you want to do your evaluation of your ecosystem services. And uh, who are the uh, key stakeholders involved? And that also includes beneficiaries of the, the benefits that provide your ecosystems you're working on. So um, when you do your ecosystem services, um, you know that um, decision makers are likely to be concerned with uh, you know, social, ecological, and economic consequences of their decisions. So we need to assess ecosystem services and their relative values um, at the site of interest and compare uh, these estimates to plausible alternative states. So for instance, um, as um, a business as usual, uh, coastal development is at the, the, the top uh, right hand of the slide, um, or under a natural-based scenario, which is at the bottom um, uh, right of, of the slide. And by doing the comparative valuation, so you're valuing the change in ecosystem uh, services delivery, decision makers, makers can really assess the net consequences of, of, uh, of their decisions um, and um, know which benefits may be lost or which ones may be gained. Um, also, what would be the impact on beneficiaries, um, and they can make informed uh, decisions on which options is the most beneficial to people, but also uh, to biodiversity. So um, it's really essential, it's crucial to uh, also take into account beneficiaries when you do your comparative valuation, um, to understand how the changes in the delivery of ecosystem services will impact those users, um, depending on who they are, where they live, and how and when they use the services. Um, they, the, you know, there's a lot of factors um, that play a role in the distribution of the benefits, and it is really important to understand how those ecosystem services are, are distributed. And so social, political, and economic and ecological uh, factors will play a role uh, in, uh, in those distribution at the local, national, and global level. And the future uh, changes in the ecosystem uh, service delivery uh, within your uh, different options will affect also differently diverse group of people. And I think that's, that's very uh, important to, to point out. So for instance, if we look at the, the table here, the carbon, carbon storage um, in a converted um, option of the land would have a negative impact uh, to the beneficiary, not only you know, um, um, at the local level, but at the global level. Um, when we look at uh, cultivative crops, for instance, that will have a more positive um, um, benefits for a national at the national level um, because it uh, would be uh, sold um, at this at this scale. So it's really important to understand uh, the distribution and uh, who are the beneficiaries and and where they live and how the ecosystem services are used. The outputs of your uh, comparative valuation um, would be to synthesize your results. Um, and now we do have evidence that shows that restoring or conserving natural habitats often provides greater net economic benefits than when converted. Uh, this has been shown in uh, different studies, but uh, this one is from uh, Bradbury and all um, from 2021. They um, synthesized results from 62 application of um, toolkit of, of uh, TESA, which is a toolkit for ecosystem services a site-based uh, assessment, um, and this toolkit provides practical methods to users uh, for assessing the, the difference um, um, of ecosystem services flows provided by a site under different states, uh, as we've seen. Uh, the, the results here um, in the graph present um, the um, results of 24 sites for which the economic value uh, of ecosystem services were given. Uh, the team compared um, their um, natural focused uh, state, uh, which is um, natural uh, conservation state and ecological uh, restoration state, 
um, with alternative stage uh, with a modification so human modifies such as a conversion to agriculture and pre-restoration uh, alternative states such as a coastal area claim for agriculture and by working out the annual uh, net value of the range of goods and services for each site under each state and um, they uh, showed that um, uh, the restoring or conserving, so the nature focus state was uh, globally more valuable in the different ecosystems. Um, and that said that for um, the, the, the nature based solution, if we um, take that into account, and um, if we really want to understand how to finance a solution based on nature and invest in them, we need to assess, of course, uh, those economic values um, they bring. So the, the role of economic valuation is to measure explicitly any resulting gains and losses um, in human welfare from uh, the changes in, in, in benefits and the comparative valuation among nature based solutions. Um, with other intervention can then be used to guide uh, the necessary changes in coastal policies and management to actually control the threats and pressure we've seen uh, at the beginning of, uh, of the webinar. And Sophia, we'll ask you to speed up a little bit, please. Yeah, uh, last. Uh, so um, the outcomes of it uh, is that you can provide impacts of those natural-based solutions on the ecosystem services provision until um, you know, the influence of at the local level on the policies, but also at the global level to inform uh, human uh, well-being. And um, Senna will present now the cost benefits yeah. analysis uh, of nature-based yes. solution. So now I will go into the um, basic principles of uh, cost benefits analysis. And I'm trying to pass here. Yeah. So the purposes of uh, cost benefit analysis uh, are to demonstrate the socioeconomic opportunity of NBS uh, on the long term. Uh, also to highlight in general uh, the minimal management costs uh, that balance the relative uh, high investment costs. And finally, to set milestones and size the NBS intervention according to the initial challenges uh, that are uh, to be tackled and the needs uh, that, I, uh, that are, are to be satisfied. So basically, um, I will go to, through the steps of uh, the cost benefits analysis in order to give you a, a better idea of how to perform this uh, cost benefit analysis. I'm trying to pass the slide, but I can't, I think. Yeah. Um, first, so you should uh, look at the, the benefits of the nature-based solution uh, by evaluating the material and immaterial implications of uh, the in NBS intervention compared to a situation where you don't implement uh, any um, nature-based solution, which is the statu quo. Uh, scenario. And for this, uh, you will use the ecosystem services assessment approach, uh, which is really useful and which we presented just before. So on the graph, uh, you can see that uh, the benefits of uh, nature-based solutions uh, correspond to the extra value of ecosystem services that is generated by a high protection scenario or NBS scenario. So you will need uh, basically to monetary assess the ecosystems of the sites to, um, to, to perform this cost benefits analysis. Uh, then you will have to evaluate the costs of your solutions. Uh, so for the NBS, but also for the alternative or statu quo scenario. And this could be the costs of implementation that uh, exist only at the start of the project. Uh, such as uh, land acquisition price or the price of planning works or preliminary studies uh, or all the uh, other costs that happen at the beginning of uh, the, um, the project. Or that could be also uh, the cost of management uh, or maintenance that can happen all along the project, such as monitoring studies, uh, the management of the site, uh, or the monitoring of risks and nature quality, for, for example. So that would be the cost part. And finally, uh, once you have the costs and benefits, you can compare those. Um, 
And on the left, you can answer the question about benefits. So how much the site, the site represents in terms of value? And on the right, uh, how much the project costs? And you can do this for your nature-based solution scenario and for your statu quo scenario. And face, facing those numbers enables you to see uh, if it is interesting or not to invest in a nature-based solution on the long term uh, regarding the benefits value that a nature-based solution can provide. So in most cases, all, of course, uh, benefits uh, that you, you could see on the left on the previous graph, um, in socioeconomic figures, uh, they stand out from this analysis as they are more tangible for decision makers when translated in, into monetary terms. Uh, and hence, uh, those figures can stimulate investment uh, in nature and stimulate uh, finance uh, in nature-based solutions. So just to illustrate uh, quickly this, uh, this methodology, um, we, we have uh, at Vertigo Lab uh, performed uh, such a study. And so the first step was to make a site diagnosis. Uh, so it was uh, in the south of France. And we had a, a site uh, which uh, was facing several threats and pressures. So such as uh, water and air pollution, uh, soil erosion, coastal erosion, but also marine uh, submersion and flood. And we uh, analyzed also the protection measures that were in place and the ones that were planned also. And for the NBS scenario, we considered uh, the local coastal conservatory um, uh, strategy, which uh, planned to set uh, operational measures to protect uh, the ecosystems uh, So in this strategy. I'm sorry, Selma, I'm going yes. also to ask you to speed up a little bit. Okay. Thank you. Okay, fine. So the, the second step was just to give you an idea about uh, how we looked at the ecosystem services value provided by the current um, uh, ecosystem, uh, state of ecosystems. Uh, and we did it by uh, doing research and interviews uh, with local stakeholders. So we had this value. The third uh, step uh, was uh, to look at the benefits uh, of the scenarios like uh, which, uh, so the first scenario was the scenario of high protection, which is considered as the NBS scenario. And the second scenario was the statu quo, which is the weakening uh, protection scenario. We had uh, a value for each of these those scenario. And then we do the we calculated the difference between those two to get the benefits. And we saw that the benefits of the high protection scenario, so the NBS was 5.5 million euros per year. And uh, we also uh, calculated the, the costs of uh, both uh, scenarios. And so we integrated uh, what was available for us uh, in the study, uh, which is the planning and management costs, uh, which uh, were of uh, 286 uh, euros per hectare and per year. And we also considered uh, the opportunity costs uh, of urbanization. And uh, the, we also took in consideration the wetlands value. So uh, I can uh, go more into details if you have more questions, but I will just pass um, to see that uh, we compared uh, to, to, to finish the, the costs and the benefits of, uh, of uh, those uh, two planning um, scenarios. And we saw that the benefits uh, value was much, were more, much higher uh, than the costs uh, of uh, implementing uh, the, the nature-based solution. So uh, that the benefit uh, for from the ecosystem protection provided by the NBS costs um, uh, covered uh, the cost engaged by the cons coastal conservatory uh, strategy. So we proved that um, the NBS was more interesting on the socioeconomic point of view, as benefits were more important than the costs. And I will give you, uh, I give Naima the, the control. 
Thank you. So I have another little survey for all of you. So as the one before, normally you should have a little pop-up on your window. So I have two questions for you. The first one is, have you planned or are you planning on nature-based solution implementing phase? And the second one is, have you ever considered or would you consider assessing the cost benefit of a or multiple nature-based solution intervention? Meaning you will compare at least two option scenarios. So I'll give everyone a few seconds to go ahead and answer the survey. And then we can see uh, the results. Thank you very much for all of your answers. Now we'll share the results. Yeah, so and we Sophie can and Selma comments maybe. Yeah, we can see that uh, there there's a great proportion of uh, people uh, with eighty percent almost uh, who have uh, planned or plan or will plan uh, an NBS. Um, implementing phase so that's interesting for you to have uh, the methodology that we we could uh, present you um, and so we also see that the cost benefits analysis is is of interest for you so i i hope that uh, what we give you will be useful for you and i think that the methodology, the proper methodology uh, would be more uh, detailed uh, in the next webinars. So just to, to tell you that. I don't know if, and sophie you want to add something about that? I, th I think it's, uh, no, it's, it's very good. And, and like you said, um, the, the detail of the methodology will be uh, you know, provided in the, in the second webinar. And uh, again, it'd be quite interesting to um, have you discussed a little bit, um, maybe if some participant can provide and share their experience um, uh, later on when we have the question answers and, and discussion uh, part of, at the end. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so we're going to listen now to how stakeholders engagement is key to succeed in implementing uh, nature-based solutions, which I think is uh, probably the, the hottest topic for all of us, and the most <laughs> challenging. So, ladies, again, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chantal. Um, so, yeah, we really wanted to uh, point out this specific uh, stakeholder engagement because it's uh, kind of the key to the success of your of your project. So, this engagement uh, will involve participants in a collaborative process that will really guide the development and achievement um, of your project, which needs to have a defined scope. Um, and these stakeholders can actually help you. Uh, define uh, this scope uh, with a clear purpose um, and, and try to target uh, goals and, and objective um, of your study, but also to help you uh, within the communication of your of your results. So those stakeholders um, uh, involved you know, um, uh, can be local, at regional, and also at the global scale. This so uh, could be local people, local authorities, um, environmental partners, such as other NGOs or even uh, researchers that can help you through the project and um, could also be people um, um, that uh, you know are uh, invested within the business sector so the private sector um, people within the government um, and also investors so investors could be of course a foundation that could give you um, fund funding uh, to implement your nature-based solution uh, or any other action of restoration the government as well uh, can provide you uh, some funding and the business sector really needs to also be engaged because they uh, can have a tremendous role um, in, in helping uh, hand in hand with uh, uh, NGOs on knowing on how to make those ecosystems more resilient uh, because they are actually uh, also dependent uh, on nature. Um, and one uh, sector that is not really um, taken into account um, most of the time um, is the media. But the media can really play a role in disseminating your outputs um, and achievement of your project. 
um, they can have a real power to raise awareness among the public and also other institutions, but also the government. So, um, you know, they are also um, uh, within the piece of, of the puzzle. So invest, investment into nature-based solution really need to triple by 2030 and uh, increase fourfold by 2050 uh, for the world to meet uh, its uh, climate change, biodiversity and land degradation targets. So including all of these stakeholders is really crucial um, and uh, governance can really encourage uh, not notably private sector um, investment by designing um, you know, policies to unlock uh, the value of uh, natural solutions. So they all they are all actors in, in the project um, and they have you know they can have extent role and um, some of them will have um, more or less interest within the projects and some uh, would have um, more influence so it means that they can actually affect the project outcomes of your project so you can um, do a stakeholder uh, mapping um, and uh, here in the in this um, in the figure we can see that you would have some stakeholders will perhaps less um, interest within your project and they won't have much uh, influence of power to push through the outcomes of your project. So they're, they're classified as a low priority, but they can give you still some essential information and objective ones um, on, on your project, just as um, you know, identification of ecosystem services or how they may use uh, you know, benefits of, of nature. Um, and then we do have those who uh, would have more interest in the project, but who have less influence and they are really important because they can give you a really good feedback um, and it's very important to collaborate with them. Um, and uh, that could be, you know, they can help you doing some analysis for um, your um, ecosystem service assessment or your cost benefit analysis. Um, and it's really important to consult them and inform them all along uh, your project. Um, and then we do have those people who have less interest uh, in your project, but have actually a big power and influence uh, to push forward, uh, for instance, the implementation of your natural-based solution, or maybe they uh, may be able to uh, provide you some funding to, um, to, to put the, the action in place. And in this case, well, they are actually a, a source of risk because they may not be that interested in your project. Um, and this is actually where you will have to try um, to keep them, you know, satisfied and discuss with them so that perhaps they would, uh, you know, come to uh, be uh, moved to the uh, top uh, uh, right uh, um, of the of the of the graph, which are those uh, with um, that can really affect positively your project, but also have um, a big interest in it. So you uh, will have, um, you know, effective coalition to support success. It's a big. Um, a relationship that we need to um, really strengthen with those stakeholders. So um, you will, you know, um, all of the stakeholder mapping will uh, help you know uh, who are the key stakeholders and how they can actually help you. So the stakeholder engagement can help you build strong collaboration uh, with partners, communities, businesses, and local to national authorities. Um, you um, that can also help you to include um, uh, and have a wider contribution to local people. And so it can empower them uh, to advocate for their needs and to be integrated in policy uh, decision-making. You can raise awareness and engage uh, those local people as well. Um, and the other key and the third one is uh, through the stakeholder engagement, this is a process of also knowledge sharing and that can also um, improve the capacity development within your own organization, but also the capacity uh, development of um, other organizations that are working uh, and in hand uh, with you. So we've seen already in conclusion uh, that the valuation of ecosystem services can really demonstrate how conserving wetlands uh, through nature-based solution can increase the benefits to people and the economic return uh, in investment. Um, the stakeholder engagement can really um, help you raise awareness among actors um, of the role of your coastal uh, wetlands, um, can empower people uh, that have sometimes less uh, voice uh, in the policy um, uh, decision making. It can help you reprioritize the action to implement for your natural based solution. Um, and the ultimate goal as well, if you really want to implement uh, your um, action of your natural based solution, is to have um, uh, the mean of, of financing uh, natural based solutions. So, as raised at the COP26, you know, capacities for many of the poorest Mediterranean countries 
um, to actually adapt to climate change and respond to drought or flooding um, and sea level rise really depend on the availability of uh, funds to support adaptation measures. So financing natural solution means financing available solutions um, that would be cost effective at the long term um, and generate, generate of course socioeconomic uh, opportunities. Um, and that should be normally and hopefully uh, the success of, uh, of your project. Um, and I think that's uh, urgently uh, required in the Mediterranean and, and uh, you know, within the Mediterranean stakeholders. And that includes also the government, also the business sector to join really forces um, and implement those innovative solutions based on nature to actually reverse uh, you know, the trends of the Mediterranean crisis. Thank you very much. Thanks, Anne-Sophie. I think uh, there's also a growing trend in this direction. So hopefully things are going to, uh, to improve in that direction in the coming years. Uh, so we'll take now some questions for those of you who are uh, willing to ask a few more details or maybe you want to share an experience. You can raise your hand or you can write questions in the chat. I don't see questions in the chat. So I guess we will have people asking directly. If people want to take the, the stage by uh, talking the problem, if you want to share your experience, you can unmute yourself. Okay, so I'm happy to open with a question. I always have a lot. <laughs> um, what would you say in your experience has been the most challenging uh, aspect? Because I mean, it, 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 we see it requires a lot of skills uh, that range from being able to run an economic analysis uh, to understand uh, how to convince a, a stakeholder. And, and this requires very, very different skills. Um, so how, how, how would you recommend to work? I mean, is it like, Maybe it sounds a little bit naive, but is it like one person doing it? Do you need a team? How, how have you been managing all this and what has been your, your biggest challenge so far in, in running these approaches? Should I start or maybe, uh, yeah. Um, well, in at, at least uh, in, on, on the way that we've been working with uh, with partners, um, you know, uh, we we are partnering with uh, Vertigolab, um, BirdLife International, and other partners in the Mediterranean basin to actually um, do some cost benefit analysis for a natural based solution. And the main point um, is, of course, um, you know, people have different expertise, um, and that's quite important. Um, especially the stakeholder engagement at the beginning to really see who can really actually help you where you have some, some gaps uh, in terms of, of skills um, to help you go and do uh, your cost-benefit analysis. Um, I think that the first stage is really to collaborate, um, also um, you know, look at your key stakeholders, who can do what and how can they help you. Um, and when you do um, have, you know, the identification of ecosystem services, it's also to um, have discussions with uh, local communities. Local communities have a tremendous uh, environmental knowledge um, in the field. So they can really help you uh, through also on already identifying your ecosystem services. When we go to the expertise of doing the cost benefit analysis, well, hopefully within the, the next webinar, you will all be prepared uh, to go on uh, with, with doing it and, and knowing it. It's also to find ways and tools with uh, consistent uh, approaches um, that provide non-specialists on how to go and how to do those cost-benefit analysis. And this is what we are trying actually to do um, in collaboration with uh, Vertigolab. Um, to provide some guidelines uh, to non-specialists. There are um, you know, some tools um, out there already um, that provide um, um, non-specialists on how to uh, go about ecosystem services assessment. Um, so the, the toolkit of TESA, for instance, the, the toolkit for ecosystem service site-based uh, assessment, and I'm happy to, to put the, the link on the chat, um, really enable um, people to, you know, with practical methods that are um, 
um, easy uh, to, to use, at least less complex to, uh, to do the ecosystem service assessment. Uh, not obliged to do a monetary value. Um, sometimes, you know, just a qualitative assessment uh, is already um, descriptively enough uh, to provide some answer uh, on how important these uh, uh, services are used by different uh, beneficiaries. And I think globally, uh, those, uh, these are these, the, the three dimensions that really need to be taken into account. Maybe Selma have um, you know, um, another um, additional uh, view on, on it, on her experience. In the meantime, the, the link is now in the chat for those of you who are interested by the knowing more about Tessa. Yeah, I would say that one of the most difficult part is uh, the access to data. So it's mm. linked to the to what you were saying about the stakeholders, because you have to see who uh, has the data. Uh, and identify the, um, the pertinent um, stakeholders and uh, people who have the knowledge uh, to help you perform the economic uh, valuation. Um, so that's, I think that that's the, the greatest um, yeah, break that, but you, we can like, we can do also without uh, data. <laughs> I mean, uh, we can use approximates uh, to to do estimations. So, so yeah, there is a methodology to 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 work on this difficulty. I okay. Think. Okay. Thank you. Uh, anyone? That's your chance. You want to ask questions or share an experience or. Uh, maybe one one challenge you have or a difficulty or a good news. I, I can you know I can give an, an example from um, the, the, the the MAPA project. If there's no one who wants to, to take the stage, I know there's some participants here and, and partners that are here that really had challenges and could actually um, uh, discuss them. Um, and like I said, uh, Selma, uh, often the, ch the challenges that the partners find is, um, you know, time to have the meetings with stakeholders, you know, um, also nowadays with the, 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 the COVID situation did not really help to, uh, to do the stakeholder engagement. It's, uh, you know, a, a, an even additional challenge. Um, and also the data, sometimes it's a long wait uh, for, for having the data. And, uh, for instance, in, in uh, 2018 to 2020, we did have uh, an assessment of ecosystem services in, in Sardinia with our partner, uh, METSI, and uh, Vania will be present later on um, the, 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 the ecosystem services assessment uh, made, made in, in, uh, in Sena, Aubia. And the challenge was to actually obtain some um, robust and accurate data sometimes because um, it's um, sometimes, you know, the, the, for instance, water quality um, was actually assessed and not, um, uh, you know, the sample, sample size. So the, the number of time that the water quality was assessed uh, wasn't really um, done in a consistent way. In this case, uh, as I said, Selma, you need to find ways and alternatives to um, find uh, other ways to do it. Um, either by finding other organizations that are actually working also on this kind of um, um, evaluation of ecosystem services or go uh, you know, uh, in the field by yourself. But of course, um, it is a trade-off between you know, time, um, energy, and also funding for, uh, for the, the, the partners. Okay. I think it's, it's interesting, this trend that... Uh, uh, we need to have more and more scientists to step out of the silo, if I may say, and, and go and talk to people. Uh, I think this is going to be a, an increasing challenging challenge. Uh, I see a question appearing. How can you convince decision makers of the importance of nature-based solutions? Have specific communication strategies been established to promote nature-based solution? Should I take or Salma, do you want to take the... May I just have maybe an element uh, in mind. 
which is that uh, usually uh, the socioeconomic uh, impacts of uh, nature-based solutions are um, uh, an, a very convincing argument for decision makers. So that communicating the result the results in uh, socioeconomic and terms and monetary values uh, sh should be systematic uh, to enhance uh, decisions. And I think, and Sophie, you you agree with uh, with this? Yeah, and I, and I think now, um, you know, as presented at the beginning of the of the agenda, um, with the you know the 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 new um, global biodiversity framework and all the the the, the new um, uh, uh, you know restoration law from the uh, European Commission. Um, you know the member states really need to commit to to those targets. So um, now they really have to um, you know find and um, look at information and local information. We you know, uh, there's, there was like some conferences with with EPES and and a lot of things have been said that actually you know they are, they are kind of the, the the bridge with the the governments and I think that's what we really need is find some you know local to global approaches and find organization that can help um, really provide those information that um, you know we have from different sites um, and for instance join forces in the Mediterranean to have, for instance, a, you know, there's a, a Mediterranean um, alliance that has been created and those people are working in partnership together um, to you know, gather information on um, restoration, best practices, um, looking at information on ecosystem services. And I think now we, you know, we really need to gather those information together, um, but also find um, coordinators that could, you know, Put and put the bridge um, and inform governments, but also engage the business sector into the, the discussion and to do that. And specific communication uh, strategies um, to promote nature-based solution. I think that you know the um, the, the, the the cops have, have been been a bit talking about that. Um, I know that there's a natural-based solution uh, policy tracker that has been launched by uh, Nature for Climate and uh, Metabolic um, at the COP26. Uh, um, so it's, um, it's, it's kind of, a, an, it, it uses artificial intelligence and machine learning to actually identify legislation and investment plans for natural-based solution and, and to assess their effectiveness. Um, you know, uh, it's kind of, uh, designed to serve the, the, the world uh, larger, largest global database of public policies to support nature and helping governments and, and investors um, to increase ambition and, and awareness of, of uh, nature's potential to actually uh, the climate, uh, tackle the climate uh, emergency. Um, I don't have the details on how um, it is working. Um, I'm uh, you know, more than happy to uh, maybe share um, the, the link to, to this. Um, but what I can also say is that uh, the communication strategy, I think it's quite important. It's something that we probably present in the second webinar as well, is how you need to communicate your data. Um, and this is different with the, the, the targets of your, of your audience. So depending on who you are actually targeting, the communication will be different. And I think that's um, quite uh, important to, um, uh, to provide. Yeah, I think less and less there is a, a, an already made solution or a package. As we were saying, it's it's more about getting into a, a mindset uh, to to talk to people. Uh, yeah. we, we're going to need to break. Uh, I would suggest we break for five minutes, uh, so we can start again. At uh, I'm sorry, it's going to be uh, three fifty two sharp. <laughs> Uh, so 3.52 in five minutes, uh, we're all back here. Um, I think it's, uh, it's important that uh, you're all back uh, to listen to more concrete cases. And uh, actually, if you can leave your mic uh, on mute and maybe you turn off your camera, it's probably easier for, for all of you uh, to reconnect rather than uh, 
turning off and uh, and coming back. So five minutes for everyone to walk a little bit, get a bit of fresh air, and uh, we are back with the more stories from the ground. Thanks. So welcome back, everyone. I hope we haven't lost too many people during the break. Uh, so we are going now from, uh, I wanted to say from theory, but we had actually quite a concrete approach and lots of examples also in the in the first part, let's say, of this afternoon. But uh, uh, we'll go even more to the ground uh, with the presentation of a project uh, taking place in Sardinia and another one in Spain. Uh, both are part of uh, the integrated management for the conservation uh, of Mediterranean wetlands, uh, nature-based solutions and sustainable economic practices project, uh, which is a project funded by the MAVA Foundation, and they aim to reduce the impact on critical uh, Mediterranean wetlands such as uh, water abstraction and coastal development. So I suggest we listen to the two testimonials and then we will take questions. We're going to start with the case of uh, Sardinia in Italy, uh, and I'm calling now Vania Satsu. Vania is an environmental economist. She has a political and science uh, and statistics background. So uh, she's worked for universities and research centers on consumer preferences for green technologies and practices. She's also worked on monetary valuation of ecosystem services, on social capital. Uh, and this is not, uh, this doesn't stop here. Vanya uh, is a founder uh, and vice president of the METSI Foundation, where she's in charge of natural capital and ecosystem services assessment and activities addressed to improve uh, sustainability in the private sector. Uh, last but not the least, she is the technical coordinator of the Maristanis project that aims at creating a new integrated shared governance model for the six Ramsar sites that are found in the uh, area of Oristano, that's the uh, western coast of uh, Sardinia. Um, and last uh, point about Vanya, she's an environmental advisor to uh, uh, and she supports companies uh, and public administrations in the adoption of the sustainability indicators, including the uh, UN SDGs 2030. So, Vanya, uh, the floor is yours. I think uh, uh, you are uh, on. You're traveling today. I think you. Where are you? I'm here. Ah, Thank great. Yes. I couldn't see you. <laughs> yes. I'm here. Thank you. What a curriculum you have, Vania. Really, yes. that's impressive. Um, I hope that you can see my presentation. Yes. Yes, we Seems. can. Yes, as told you by Chantal, um, Medzi is based in Sardinia and is working uh, on the Maristanis project that includes uh, six uh, Ramsar sites uh, in the western coast of Sardinia. Concerning the ecosystem services analysis, we focus uh, in the first phase only on in, in one of these uh, um, lagoons and ponds, and especially on the lagoon of Senarubia. This is a peculiar um, site because it's the remaining part of a larger pond that was reclaimed 100 years ago and uh, was created an agricultural area that is uh, currently mainly under the uh, nitrate directive due to, tele to the large amount of um, uh, manure and slurries due to the cattle breeding that is uh, uh, in the area and especially in southern part of the uh, Senarubia Lagoon. All the other ecosystem services uh, like the um, pine wood that is uh, um, um, between the uh, dunes and the uh, lagoon is an uh, artificial uh, ecosystem. So it's a very fragile uh, um, area, but it's also uh, very important for the biodiversity. So this area is not only a Ramsar site, but also an important bird area as it is inserted in the Natura 2000 network. 
uh, the area is very important also from an economic point of view because around and inside of the lagoon, uh, several economic activities was carried out and especially traditional fish and aquaculture activities and uh, um, growing uh, uh, crops and vegetables. The uh, cattle breeding related to the dairy sector, but also to meat production. It's also a place where uh, local international tourists uh, um, love to spend their time, uh, especially during summer months. And it's a really important uh, cultural heritage site, not, not only for people in Arborea, but also for all the Sardinian people. Several trees uh, um, created uh, issues in this area. Water abstraction due to agriculture, but also to the sector, salt intrusion due to the, um, uh, sea level rise and also water abstraction uh, from people in the area. The excess of nitrate that, um, as I told before, um, created several problems um, in this uh, uh, part of the Sardinia and the climate change. This area uh, is uh, uh, severely affected by floods, as uh, Anne-Sophie told before, and uh, extreme rainfalls. Um, in some cases also suffering from coastal floods. And uh, on the other side, drought uh, is also one of the other problems that uh, periodically affect the uh, Senarubia site. Coastal erosion of the beach is uh, uh, partly due to the effect of climate change, partly due to the um, infrastructure that was built in the past year to uh, try to protect the mood from, uh, to the sea of the lagoon. Uh, then lack of governance. The, that is one of the big issues of this area, but also of the other areas in the Maristanis project. Our objective was to strengthen the protected area management. As I told, told you before, this is a, a Natura 2000 site uh, with a new shared governance model through a private public uh, involvement. Um, I will explain later what we mean about shared governance. Uh, we aim also to restore riparian areas to create uh, new areas uh, to protect the spe species and uh, to um, recreate habitats, uh, remove invasive and alien species, and in this area is especially the blue crab, control the access to the lagoon and avoid that people uh, could assess the, the lagoon and also the dunes by cars, and uh, the reduction of uh, chemicals in uh, agriculture to improve water quality and also soil quality. What uh, means uh, this? Means to introduce in the area more effective regulations, also to control access and also to reduce the chemicals in agriculture, but also to um, raise the awareness of fishing farmers and tourist operators about their role of guardians of the lagoon, because they are the people that are living day by day in the lagoon. So they are uh, the, um, uh, the power to uh, act uh, um, to preserve the lagoon and also to uh, provide early warnings on new uh, problems that uh, are arriving in the lagoons, as happened, for example, for the arrival of blue crabs in the lagoon. Uh, but also to um, provide evidence that uh, we can have uh, new forms of economic earnings uh, from natural restoration and preservation. This is the current state of Senarubia. I told you before, this is the protected area is uh, uh, under Natura 2000. And this is the area with uh, um, regulation uh, concerning the use of nitrates in agriculture. These are some pictures that represent the economic activities, but also the ecosystems. On the other side, uh, we have uh, the uh, alternative state that will um, use in the first phase to evaluate ecosystem services with uh, the um, current protected area with the most effective regulation and the future buffer area 
with a, a large regulation of uh, uh, economic activities, but also tourist, tourism, especially to avoid that uh, um, touristic activities could affect uh, nested uh, um, activities for bird life. Um, this is uh, some example of the restoration activities that I will explain better later. The ecosystem services assessed in the first phase are cultivated goods, harvested goods that refer to the fishing and aquaculture that are traditional practices, but are um, addressed to the regional market, so are not only for self-consumption. The nature-based creation and tourism, because a camping is inside the Ramsar site, and the cultural services as a connection to the nature. Uh, the, effect, the results of our um, for, uh, assessment demonstrate that all the sectors could have net benefits from a more um, uh, what restoration and a more sustainable um, uh, management of the area. Uh, farming activities, for example, uh, will benefit by uh, 3% uh, more um, from uh, adopting sustainable practices instead uh, to use chemicals. And this is a big um, result for us because sometimes it's thought that uh, um, uh, sustainability could decrease the um, earnings of agriculture um, companies. But in that case, uh, we demonstrated that uh, at least there is no a, no a decrease, but there are a small increase. Uh, there is a 25% increase in the um, uh, recreational activities in tourism and 82% increase in fishing activities due to the um, improving uh, water quality. So the reduction of fish loss due to low water quality uh, related to the decrease of uh, uh, chemicals in agriculture, but also due to the um, practices introduced to regulate blue crabs into the lagoon, so to keep these invasive species under control, and also to the possibility to develop um, alternative um, activities related to tourism due to a better quality of water and um, riparian areas in the lagoon. So what is demonstrated was that a large benefit could achieve to the lagoon of Senarubia with improving uh, environmental quality. Um, of course, uh, this uh, um, scenario uh, was um, analyzed without taking into account the interaction with the climate change. Uh, that will be what we uh, do in the second phase, as uh, uh, briefly told before, uh, after. Uh, concerning the socio-cultural values, uh, we um, demonstrate that local people have a strong attachment to the area, and they found that uh, preserve and improve environmental quality of Senarubia is important, especially for the health and for the leisure. Uh, cultural uh, ecosystem services provided by the uh, Lagoon of Senarubia. The willingness to pay that we estimate indicate that residents will support strong measures to preserve the cultural values provided by the wetlands. Uh, this result was important because it was uh, uh, used also to draft the action plan of the Maristanis Costa Wetland Contract, which is a voluntary agreement introduced by the, national, the Italian national legislation to promote a shared governance uh, of rivers, lakes, and wetlands. And this is the first uh, new governance model that we introduce in this area. And this is a, um, a new model because the uh, coastal um, contract uh, will create an instrument that let public and private sector to cooperate to better manage uh, environmental areas and especially those related to um, water ecosystems. 
Uh, the result was also useful to demonstrate the benefit from investing in sustainable innovation in farming and fishing sectors. And it was also a good guidance for addressing new funds or new policies to be supported through new funds. It was also useful for the new regional government sustainability plan, uh, uh, also for the update of other uh, plans because uh, this result was also used for the Costa Rica contract that is uh, under the coordination of the regional government. And this kind of result could be useful for new environmental policies that uh, uh, should be introduced into the uh, regional uh, activities. For example, the resilience and recovery plans and funding that are now um, under planning. Um, in the second phase, uh, we will focus more on the climate change effect uh, in this area. If the Senarubia Lagoon is mainly affected from inland flood, as Anne Sophie uh, told before, the other site that uh, we decided to introduce in this analysis is uh, most affected by coastal floods. The Corus Italy and Coromannu uh, site is um, in the same municipality of uh, um, Senarubia, uh, but is a more coastal uh, lagoon because it's only a small uh, beach could um, preserve the, the area. And is a peculiar site because in the Ramsar site is also including this uh, uh, marine part that uh, um, um, is characterized by Posidonia Meadows. So we decided to enlarge also the um, site of Senarubia, including uh, Posidonia uh, Meadows part, in order to um, understand um, how Posidonia could act as a natural-based solution to avoid um, damages created by climate change. Uh, concerning the benefit of the area are more or less the same, but, but in this part of the Corus Italy is settled one of the most important aquaculture company in, in Italy, and uh, also a seafood canning and transformation activities is located in the area. Um, the two sites, Corus Italy and Senarubia, are also important because uh, they, they belong to the regional government, but they were assigned to local fishermen cooperatives that are also in charge of hydraulic maintenance, while all the, the other maintenance activities are in charge of the local municipalities. So uh, the objectives for this second phase was to strengthen the connection between the Maristani's coastal wetland contract and ne regional national plans for uh, climate change mitigation and adaptation, um, to uh, analyze national disaster risk reduction for both coastal floods and coastal erosion, um, improving management practices and especially uh, the farming and fishing management practices referring the pond and increase the benefit um, that a, a better management could provide for people. Uh, preserving, of, of course, the local values. So all the cultural benefits that provide, are provided by the two lagoons. Uh, the cost benefit analysis will be uh, performed using three uh, scenarios, the nature based scenario, the business as usual with the climate change and uh, also the standard mitigation measure with the climate change. So comparing what will happen in the future, taking into account uh, uh, the climate change conditions. If uh, we um, invest in nature based scenarios, uh, natural based solutions, sorry, um, business as usual, and uh, or we invest in standard mitigation measures. What are our natural based solutions? Uh, to uh, restoring the dunes that are in this area um, in order to uh, provide the first barriers to the uh, coastal climate change uh, negative consequences, to restore the uh, pine wood in this area and also in this area, to restore Posidonia, 
using the um, results of other projects that we are conducting in other area of the uh, Orisano Gulf and Sardinia, we could also um, try to understand um, uh, how to restore the Posidonia Midov could uh, be um, important to uh, avoid the coastal erosion and coastal floods. Sorry uh, to speed you up, uh, yes. Vanya. I, 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 this is the, <laughs> it's the, really the frustrating because it's yeah. so interesting, everything, and it's like, okay. Uh, yes, and... Uh, um, Yes, uh, and also uh, to take into account, of course, sustainable agricultural practices and the interaction with the climate change. Uh, the ecosystem services that will assess are um, uh, coastal erosion control, the uh, coastal floods related to sea level rise that, uh, you, as you can see in this picture, could uh, severely affect this area in 2100. Um, the global climate regulation, so how to restore this ecosystem could provide a, a, a way to um, stock um, uh, CO2 emissions and water quality that is uh, um, affected by climate change and um, uh, economic activities. Finished. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much, Vanya. So let's, uh, let's move now to the second presentation uh, with uh, Jesus, Jesus Pinilla. Jesus is an environmental biolo biologist, sorry. And he's been working for CEO BirdLife, um, which is the BirdLife partner in Spain for the last 25 years. He is now coordinating projects from bird uh, bringing and sensors to conservation of sites and species. He also represents his organization in different uh, regional, Andalusian in his case, uh, boarding committees such as flora and fauna, biodiversity and rural development. So Jesus, uh, I don't know if you, if you are here. Yes, I am. Yes, good. So the floor is yours. Thank you, Chantal. Um, good afternoon. Uh, to you all, and uh, thank you very much for being there, uh, because you are still there, aren't you? Yes, uh, we still have uh, both 20 okay. people. Okay, okay. So. Um, well, uh, let me share with you a, a small picture of what we've been doing in within this uh, project of integrated management for the conservation of Mediterranean wetlands. And let's start presenting the site, which is the natural park of Bahia de Cadiz, which is located, as you can see, in southern Spain, near the Strait of Gibraltar. And within this site, uh, we've got two main environments, the salt marshes, which comprises the most of the site, but we've got also um, an interesting a coastal stretch uh, depicted here in this uh, super fashion pink color in the right uh, left hand side of the of the picture. Uh, most of these um, salt marshes uh, have been transformed into salinas. This kind of of structures that you can see here in the picture. It all started uh, around the, the, the Roman times. I can't remember the, the details uh, because I was still a baby back then. But um, since then, it has uh, the area, these uh, type of structures and management have produced many benefits, uh, both to people, salt production being the, the main, uh, but also others, as you can see here in the list, and also to biodiversity. The management of the water levels that is needed for these productions, salt of fishes, is very important for uh, feeding and nesting migratory birds. And the conservation of this habitat, the, the salinas, was actually the, the basis for the declaration of the site as a natural park uh, back in the 
1990s. However, uh, important and significant changes in the markets of uh, the salt and uh, the fishes have led to the abandonment of many of these salinas. Uh, at present, around 75% of them are abandoned. And this represents an important loss of uh, biodiversity. There are other threats in the area, as you can see here in the list, like coastal erosion, climate change, or human pressure that are also shared with other coastal wetlands. So we've uh, set our objectives within the project. Uh, quite ambitious, I know, but it's important uh, to, to try to find solutions to the consequences of, of the abandonment of, of these salinas, consequences to people and birds. Um, it's important also to improve the marshland management in order to reduce the natural disaster risk in the area. And all this can only be achieved through and with the natural park managers. So for this, we are um, performing a cost benefit analysis as we've seen before today, um, comparing uh, business as usual scenario, things as they are now and uh, as we can foresee them uh, to evolve in the next few decades against an NBS scenario. For this, uh, we have selected these uh, ecosystem services to be assessed, ocean control, flood protection, and global climate regulation, and have um, designed or determined these uh, future alternative scenario with nature-based solutions, such as marshland restoration, uh, salt ponds, sustainable management, and also dune protection and restoration. The details on the procedures and the results of uh, this assessment will be presented in the forthcoming webinars. That's it. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Jesus. Uh, so as said, we're going to take questions now. Um, anyone? I don't know if we have any question in the chat. Naima, maybe you can help me check. Otherwise, people just uh, step in, take the Take the floor, you just need to unmute your mic and camera, I guess. So whether you have questions to uh, Vania and or Jesus, feel free to, to let us know. I will just uh, share with you the, um, the links um, presenting the reports uh, of the examples I have shared in my presentation. I will just share it in the, in the chat. Okay, so and I think it will also be good in the in the email follow up to also add this information. Yes, sure. Definitely. Okay. Okay, questions. Is it um is it overall too difficult or too challenging or uh, easy and clear but um you don't know where to start from. I think it would be interesting also to, to hear you uh, participants on how you feel about the whole uh, presentation. It's the first webinar, so we can still adapt for the coming ones. No one, no one wants to give comments or ask questions.
I will, I will ask one as usual. <laughs> uh, I asked Anne Sophie about the challenges uh, in the in the previous uh, uh, sessions. I, I would like to hear you, Vania and Jesus, also tell us uh, what were your uh, positive uh, surprises or positive uh, results uh, or something that came unexpectedly uh, as a very good news for you in the work. Because, I mean, it's a challenging process, definitely, but I'm pretty sure that uh, there are days when you feel like hope is here and, and things can really make a difference. Things you're doing, of course, can make a difference. Who wants to answer that? Me, I can also try to answer one of the two questions that I read in, in the chat. Yes, of course, is uh, especially for us that are Sardinian people working in Sardinia is quite important to uh, to produ produce studies that could be transformed in something concrete to improve uh, uh, environmental quality, but also the. Um, the work quality and the uh, uh, life's uh, quality for the local people. Um, in our case, uh, of course, a, a better uh, management of the uh, wetland areas, not only the two that I presented today, could create new uh, jobs. Um, I, I show something about the tourism sector and uh, the tourism in wetlands is uh, uh, totally um, underdeveloped in, uh, especially in Sardinia and in Italy. Uh, while we, uh, when we sp spoke with uh, um, tourists, especially tourists coming from abroad and from other Italian regions, they will be really interested in having more opportunities to better know uh, the, um, the wetlands and especially to have the opportunity to have experiences related to the bird watching, for example, or also activities related to the fishing activities. Could the fish uh, something uh, in the uh, um, acting as a, a, a fisherman? So working in a traditional way could be a really interesting um, experience from tourists uh, that uh, generally arrive in Sardinia only to stay uh, lying in the beaches. So, well, uh, it's hard not to. They are beautiful. The sea is yeah. amazing. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, of course, we, I, I am, I'm pretty sure that with a good, uh, uh, with a, a better and also integrated managerial um, system, we could improve activities, of course better managerial uh, tools means to uh, put together all the actors in the territory. So regional government, municipalities, but also the private sector that is operating in the area. Okay, Jesus? Yes, for me, um, as I have told, um, the area was declared as a natural park in order to preserve a certain specific habitat, Chávez Salinas, uh, which are, uh, as I've already told you, um, most of them abandoned. And, and this, this is a problem. And uh, this is the, the, the main threat that uh, the park managers are facing and the only solution to that uh, for the, the last uh, 20 or 30 years has been to recover, to rebuild those Salinas that have been lost. In, um, in a meeting that we, uh, um, that we did uh, with different stakeholders, uh, we, we put on the table Another option, which is uh, the, the marshland restoration, natural marshland restoration, which hasn't been uh, selected or, or, or uh, included within the, the, uh, the management of, of the site to, to, to restore, to, to, to go back to the natural marsh, uh, in, and uh, 
it it was very well received so these managers and the uh, and the, the the boarding committee of the of the natural park as as a solution as a as a different uh scenario and uh, it was uh, quite rewarding for us uh, to 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 have that after this uh, meeting thank you Interesting. Uh, I, I know that, Vanya, you partly, partially answered to the, the questions we have uh, in the list. Uh, so we have two. We have how to evaluate efficient management of wetlands. Are there specific tools? Uh, well, I guess they are all connected to what you are presenting today. Uh, and then is it a good managerial system to generate jobs for rural communities? Uh, I also think that uh, Vanya was answering to this, but please, uh, Tufik and Sana, if you feel we haven't given you a complete answer, just let us know and we're happy to, to build on this. No, thank you so much. The answer was uh, clear enough. Okay, thank you. Sana, may I ask you what you're working on while yes. you're there? Yes, uh, first I'm from, from Lebanon. I teach at the Lebanese University. And uh, um, I have, uh, I, I uh, manage a, an NGO called the Green Community. So we have a program uh, based in a, uh, uh, to manage a rural area. It's a protected site. We call it the Valley of Small Lambs. Uh, we're trying to, uh, it's not a wetland, but it is a, a protected site and you are trying to connect the communities uh, uh, the communities to the uh, to, to this protected side and create maybe you know the, the situation in Lebanon now is very difficult so we are trying to create jobs to generate things to make people feel that uh, nature environment if they are good to it it can ge generate income so that's what you are trying to figure out and you're trying to, to see the funding and things like this how is it going uh not, not good, not bad. We, we got a, a small fund now for this, but I think um, women and young people are, are helping as uh, they are. So start uh, something that, may, that might help them. Let's say uh, maybe artisanal product, uh, things that they can do from there, uh, tracking, a little bit of guidance and trying to, to put some laws with the regulations with the Ministry of Environment here in the country. Okay, thank Good. you. Uh, thank I mean, you. You're probably in a, one of the most challenging places in the Mediterranean. Exactly, exactly. yeah. yeah. <laughs> we dropped from, from good country to, to a catastrophe, but this is life, we have to, yeah. Yes, but as you were saying, there are communities, you know, the young, the women, uh, yeah. and... Uh, yeah. We, we need to rely on this. And I hope this webinar has brought you answers. And, and, and in any case, uh, we're going to give you the, we're going to give the, the contacts of all our speakers so that if you have any question, you can, you can keep going. Uh, one more question, and then I think we're going to have to uh, come to the conclusions. Anyone wants to ask another question? Okay, in the meantime, and Sophie has put another link. Uh, I suggest that all the links we've put at some point will be also put in the uh, follow up mail. Um, okay, so I hear or see no question unless someone is typing, but I don't think so. Okay, so many thanks to all for the uh, uh, presentations, the questions. Uh, to me, I mean, time was literally flying for the, for the three hours. Um, and, uh, and I hope that the content has been useful for, uh, for everyone. So uh, uh, before we listen to Anne-Sophie and Selma for the closing remarks, uh, I, I again would like to remind that the webinar, uh, uh, there is a question. Yes, the presentations are going to be shared, uh, Sana. Do not worry. Um, 
so uh, this webinar, I was saying, is the first of a, a series of three, and you will receive more emails in the coming weeks and months about them. Uh, but you can already mark them down in your calendar. I think the dates are going to appear somewhere on the screen at some point. Uh, and and uh, these webinars actually uh, are part of a wider initiative, which is called Wetland Based Solutions. You can see the logo on top left or now on top uh, on bottom right on this uh, screen. Uh, and this project is gathering more than 30 partners, uh, uh, including those who are presenting today, in 10 Mediterranean countries around the issues of Mediterranean coastal wetlands. Um, to know more about the project, you can visit the, the, the website. Uh, it's still uh, in progress, but you still uh, can find quite uh, important and interesting information for now. Um, basically, the initiative uh, is working towards the reduction of water abstraction and coastal development through the restoration of coastal wetlands, which, as we've been saying, are among the best habitats to tackle the biodiversity and climate crisis that we are facing in the region. Uh, and we work at different levels, uh, and they, these levels include technical support, research, uh, implementation of good practices on the ground, policy and communication. So we are very um, interested as a community also uh, to not only reach out to you, but to hear from you and to uh, get your requests if you have any. Uh, so please uh, do not hesitate. Uh, I know that uh, everyone who was presenting today is also uh, quite happy to be uh, supporting your initiatives or uh, listening to your experiences. So I will pass the floor to Anne-Sophie and Selma for the closing remarks. Thank you, uh, uh, Chantal. I don't know if you can see um, my screen. Yes. Uh, and just um, as Chantal said, um, just the, the next uh, webinars, so you know it's a series of, of three webinars, so the one of today, and uh, we do have the second one um, at the same 22nd of February, and then the third one um, um, on the 3rd of May. So please uh, register to it. We will again send emails um, uh, with the uh, registration link and um, also some links and articles that have been put in the, in the chat today. Um, and um, as a closing remark, you, you can also, um, if you want, do not hesitate to send us um, questions or, um, you know, if you want to start the discussion on sharing your experience. Um, and how we can also adapt the second webinar for you, because you know the, I think this is quite important that we try to share experience between um, uh, all the different organization um, and, and know what are actually your, your needs as well. Um, so you can also implement your projects um, in your region. Um, so do not hesitate to send us uh, emails. Um, and um, I, I, I think, uh, uh, both uh, Selma and I are, um, you know, very thankful um, to everyone um, for for the webinar. Thank you very much uh, for the participant, and thank you to the Mava Foundation um, that has helped us a lot to be able to um, work in partnership with all these uh, people and also to uh, fund this uh, this webinar today. Maybe Selma, if you want to to add anything, uh, more than happy to give you the floor. Uh, I go along with you, but uh, I thank you a lot for for the, attending this webinar. And I think we'll have uh, the chance to go more into the details of the methodology to to go on the how to perform this methodology now that we have um, shown why it's uh, really important. So thank you for attending today. Thank you. So I would say see you next year at this point. And again, in the meantime, if you if you want to uh, connect with uh, our uh, speakers, uh, feel free to to do so. Uh, thanks again, and uh, and see you soon. Then, bye bye.